Good evening, everybody. Uh, I believe you're able to hear us now. Uh, really pleasure to have you all here. I'm here with Sylvia burgos Tofnis, who's our board chair, also involved in the board of Moses, so very involved in local food. My name is Mike Scott. I'm the uh, program director at Farm Table Foundation in Amory, and our mission is to build local food culture, and of course, one of the ways we do that is through offering classes right now, obviously remotely, and also through a, a great restaurant. I'm not involved in the restaurant at all, so I can brag about it, but they are doing a great job and there's great take and bake and to go. And just now where you could go sit out on our, on our patio, that's, uh, we don't want to be inside yet. So we would serve you, or you could pick up stuff and go outside and sit there. So the restaurant buys from about 26 area farmers, very local food as much as possible. Sylvia is actually one of those as well, as she is a grass-fed beef farmer. So uh, Sylvia, really glad to have you here and thank you all for joining us. And Sylvia, feel free to say more about yourself, of course, and, and we'll get going. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mike. It's so much fun to have these classes, to feel connected with other people who are so interested and so committed to food that not only tastes great, but really packs nutrition. So as Mike said, my husband Dave and I, we raised grass-fed, grass-finished beef in Western Wisconsin, not very far from the border between the states of Wisconsin and Minnesota. So I guess I'll ask a question right off the bat. Let me know what city and state you're zooming in from. I'd love to see kind of what that distribution might be. You can use that chat box, I think, at the bottom of the, the screen. And as we get moving here, I'll also mention just a little bit of housekeeping. I am going to be taking questions periodically and Mike is going to moderate that for me so that I can concentrate on the demo. I will also start off our session together with a slideshow just to make sure that you can actually see in better pictures what it sometimes is very difficult to view when you're doing a class via Zoom and you don't have a professional camera set up. So I think what we're going to do is ask another question. So Mike, any, any responses? Where, where are people Zooming in from? Well, let me see here. Clear Lake, Little Falls, uh, Trempolo County, Shoreview. Yeah, so. yeah. uh, here's Carol from Brisbane, Australia. Hi, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, Baldwin, yeah. Oh, a lot of local neighbors. Thank yep. you. I'm so glad that we're all together with this. I really appreciate it. Okay, so let's do another quick question. How many of you have made, currently make bone broth at home? Let's have a, a show of hands on that. Kristen says she's tried, but don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> someone, oh, else that's says, all right. someone else says once, someone else says once. So yeah, I must say folks, Sylvia and I were talking a little beforehand and said this is a little more niche than sourdough baking right now, but. Uh, <laughs> You're not kidding. So and I'm so glad we have as many people zooming in as we do. These are really dedicated people here. All right. So others have said they've tried it, but the, the you know the the taste isn't what they hope for. So and not, not you know have questions about how long it keeps and that kind of stuff. So, good, good. I like those questions. So keep those questions coming in. As now I go into the slideshow that we're going to do together. I pulled this together uh, especially for this Zoom class, although it contains slides and explanations that I've also used with the um, with other groups. So, again, I'm going to try this screen sharing thing. So, hold on while I do it. There we All go. right. So, making bone broth, and why do we do it? I'm so glad somebody brought up taste. If it doesn't taste good, man, that's a disappointment in so much time. We do it also because of nutrition. 
and convenience. Once you've made bone broth, you can store it and you can use it later on for all kinds of dishes. Okay, so my real introduction to bone broth happened when I was a little kid. Um, I have a distinct memory of sitting at a table, spoon in my hand, and a bowl of chicken soup. And judging from my recollection, my hand was little and a spoon was big. And so I was a kid, maybe six or seven years old. And I must have been at my grandma's house because she's the one who would cook like that. My mother, unfortunately, didn't. My grandmother would do this. And she made this soup just for me. Uh, and this was not a stay-at-home grandma. She was a laundress. Here's a picture of my grandma, Nana, from about 1967. She was a laundress. She traveled to and from work in New York City. Uh, she worked as a laundress in a hotel every single day. Uh, she traveled by train, subway, just like most of New York people have done. Um, she lived in a three-story walk-up tenement building in Spanish Harlem. And so when she went shopping, and the photos that you have on your right-hand side there of the screen, those are shots of an outdoor market called La Marqueta, that's in Spanish Harlem. She would go there, buy fresh foods of all kinds, including picking up chickens. And she would take those in shopping bags, all the way up to the apartment and begin. My grandmother was a terrific cook, fresh ingredients, everything made from scratch. In fact, when she came to the mainland from Puerto Rico as a uh, teenager, one of the things was that was earning a living by cooking for all the people within her tenement building and others who wanted to have a meal. Um, lots of people at that time for immigrants all over the world are working two and three jobs. So she was the cook and boy, she was the one who really established in my mind and in my palate that taste for really, really good food. I knew about the power of great chicken. And so when I was sick, she would make it for me. Now, what we found out is that over the years, lots of news reports and various books have been written that confirm what our grandparents knew. Cooking things like bone broth makes a difference because you not only get great flavor, but you get great nutrition. And it's not just about the ingredients themselves. It is about the preparation. And I guess that's why all of us are, are kind of involved in this Zoom class right now. So what are the benefits of bone broth? Well, protein for bodybuilding and repair, lots of minerals that are easily digestible. And Collagen. Collagen is the precursor to gelatin, and this is critical for bone strength. Now, one of the things that I think we need to keep in mind, however, is that collagen or ge the gelatin within bone broth is not a complete protein. I would not advise anybody living on bone broth alone. But when combined with vegetables, when combined, combined with other meats and other starches, it really is a, a, a complete uh, way to kind of supplement your diet. It also, the, the bone broth itself also makes lots of nutrients more available from some of the things that you add to it. Okay, so we talked about protein. There are lots of vitamins. Um, when you make your own bone broth, you also are able to avoid toxins simply by choosing the ingredients that you want. You can control the salt, you can control the other seasonings, and you can use the fats that are created when you make the broth. Okay, so the question is, how do we get from the picture on the left, and that is my farm, those are my Cattle, they're called bolingo cattle, and those chickens that we raised. 
How do you get from there to that really nice cup of bone broth in the lower picture? And again, we're going to talk not only about chicken and beef, but any other kind of bone broth that you can make with the bones of other pastured animals. These, in a sort, are the basic steps. And one of the things that you've gotten either already in an email or will soon get are my recipes for bone broth for beef, bone broth for chicken, and you can easily adapt those. Uh, and you've got some basic information about the benefits of bone broth. So these are the basic steps, not a heck of a whole lot of them. You thaw out or pull your bones out of the refrigerator, you simmer them for an extended period of time, and how you do that, what appliance you use really depends on what's in your schedule. You can use one thing or another. You cool and strain the finished broth, and I, I mentioned that lots of counter space is needed because you, you really do need to have a number of bowls going so that you can separate the solids from the fluid, from the liquid. Um, you can, if you choose, reduce the bone broth so that it takes up less space, either in your freezer or if you can it, and then you store it. You can refrigerate it for short-term use. You can freeze it. You can can it. So let's start out with those ingredients. Well, when you are making bone broth, you are extracting minerals. And if you've got meat on those bones, meat, and really pulling them from whatever meat you purchased. So you're trying to concentrate the um, availability of nutrients in a bone broth, if you have a bone, if you have a carcass from an animal that's been fed a lot of pesticides or herbicides or has been treated with other kinds of hormones, you, you may be also concentrating those kinds of uh, ingredients or those kinds of compounds within your bone broth. So you do want to, if you can, try to find things that are fairly fresh, local, and organic. Now, that does not mean that you have to buy fresh bones all the time, no. It does mean that you can actually have things in your freezer. Let's say you made a Thanksgiving meal. You got a carcass. You don't, know, you don't want to make bone broth right now. Put, the car, put that carcass in a, in, either in a glass container or put it into a plastic bag and stick it in the freezer. You've had chicken one week, you have chicken the next week, smaller bones, put a bunch of them together in a bag and stick them in the freezer. And so you can start to collect the, the ingredients that you need. Again, that whole notion of using animals that have been pastured, that have been fed non-GMO feed uh, is important. Where can you get these things? You can get them at your butcher, you can get them at your farmer's market, through your CSA, on your own farm or garden. Um, certainly, you know, I'm in a really terrific spot in that I'm growing my own beef, and in a little bit, I'll be getting chickens to augment to that. But you have opportunity to go to your butcher and say, hey, I'd like bones from animals that have been pastured. Can you find me some? Can you let me know when some might come in? You can go to your CSAs you can, and your farmer's market are especially really good sources for getting some of these kinds of bones. All right, so when we talk about beef, um, you're looking for pieces that have some meat on it. If you take a look at the upper left, you see that there's a a bone, a shank there that's got some meat on it. The other bones tend to have very little meat, but you can see the rich marrow in those bones, that center portion. Um, that's what you're looking for. And in fact, when you look for bones and considering bones for your bone broth, you want to find uh, bones that are the joint bones. 
those help a lot. Now, so you, let's say you've got all your ingredients and now you're going to think, okay, so what's your schedule like? Are you going to be home throughout the process? Do you, do you want to be able to walk away for hours? Do you need to finish up within the same day? Do you need to stretch this process across several days? That will help you determine how you do your steps and what appliance you might use. Mike, was there a question there that we need to address? Well, there is one. Uh, have you ever done bone broth from deer? I have not, but that would certainly work. Yes, it would work. It's a ruminant. Uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't. Heck, I'm sure lots of people have. Right, and Sylvia, when you mentioned going to the butcher, for example, do some butchers sell their bones um, specifically for this purpose? Uh, some may, but I think you need to approach them. A lot of them, a lot of butchers um, don't get a lot of requests for this, and so they may be surprised. Uh, I think it's really worthwhile to go to a butcher and say, hey, this is what I want to do. Could you find some bones for me, or could you let me know when some come in? One of the things that's, uh, that's really unfortunate about a lot of um, the butcher stores right now is that they're not breaking down carcasses. They're not taking it from a half or a quarter into the uh, different kinds of steaks and roasts that we want. They're getting smaller portions and maybe not all the bones that we would like. But, you know, it's really worthwhile talking to your butcher. You never know what they might be able to provide you. Okay, so here's some of the basic equipment. And pretty much what you use might depend on, again, your schedule and what you have on hand. On the left, those silvery things, of course, you recognize them as big pots. Big crock pots, they hold 8, 10, 12 uh, quarts. On the upper right is your crock pot. And to the left, you've got, or rather to the right, lower right, you've got two different kinds of pressure cookers. You've got one on the stove, and it is called a stovetop pressure cooker. And then right next to it, you have the instant pot, the electronic version of the pressure cookers. You know, I'd like to know how many people out there have used pressure cookers for making bone broth? Let me know. All right. The other thing, the other kind of pot, of course, is a big, heavy cast iron. This one is enameled in order to make sure that the flavors aren't painted. Um, and this can be used in your oven or even on your grill. So certainly if you find yourself, hey, I don't want to heat up the house by making bone broth, take it outside and use your grill. It will work very well as long as it doesn't get too hot. And most of our grills, I mean, that's what you'd have to watch for is it things becoming too hot. All right, so I'm just taking two things right now, the chicken and the beef, but consider that if you're, if you're thinking about doing anything, lamb, mutton, uh, pork, you could use the, the uh, timelines that are on the beef side, all right? And this gives you a general idea of how long it takes to make the broth. All right. Again, we're going to go back to the basic steps because if you want to cook a bone broth, you do want to consider what your own schedule might be. So you can stretch the, this, this uh, process in order to accommodate your busy life. Uh, right now, a lot of us aren't too busy, so we can devote a full day to this. But you still might want to break it up, and that's okay. So if you've got a carcass, um, bones, bones left over from, let's say, uh, roasting a chicken or grilling a chicken or a bird, um, you want to, you can do this two to three days before. Thaw it out, roast your bones, and store it in the fridge until you need it. You can use your appliance in order to then create your bone broth, again, using the one that fits your schedule. The next step is to cool it. Cool your bone broth down because now you're going to take out the solids. 
then you can refrigerate your bone broth if you want to until you take your next step. And that next step might be reducing the bone broth or, it, or putting it into jars to freeze. All right, so a first step in bone broth that really makes a difference for flavor, and some people talked about flavor, is to roast your bones for 35 to 45 minutes. If you've got these big shanks that you see here, there's a lot of bone there. Uh, you could do this with lamb, you could do this with pork, and if you've got a chicken, you know, you might roast your chicken and then you have the meat that you would take off the bones and eat and you'd save those bones for your bone broth. Sylvia, okay, so, questions here. Yes. Is there a flavor benefit, you know, to making the process last the whole day? That's one. No. Not necessarily. Things can store in the refrigerator and you can get it through and done in another day. Getting it done all in one day, it, it, it tends to be what I've done recently. But when my farming schedule gets really, really heavy, I'll break these steps up so that I can accommodate having to go out, deal with the cows, having to go out and deal with the chickens. And is there a difference between broth and stock? And if so, what is that? Okay. There's a lot of uh, about which is the kind of term that you should use. Right now, all of us are using bone broth, but I think the term that should be used is stock because it is the most basic of the... Um, the liquids that you pull from a bone. And from there, you can actually make different kinds of broth. But there is a debate about which one to use. And it has to do, to some extent, uh, from the derivation of the words. One from German and one from Latin, I think, and what they meant. So I don't know that I'd get too hung up on it. And if there's, uh, if the meat was an initially roasted, Sylvia, do you need to also roast it again there in, in terms of getting ready for the bone broth? Uh, so you're talking, all right, let me, let me see if I can answer that quickly. If in fact you've got a bunch of beef bones, yes, you do roast that. If you've got chicken um, that is uncooked, my inclination is to roast it first. Pull off the meat use the bones because one of the things that happens once you get that like whole chicken in the pot and you're making bone broth with it is that you pull so much flavor out of the chicken itself out of the meat that there's not going to be a whole heck of a lot of flavor left in it once you start making the bone broth but you know i've done it with with complete with whole chicken you just have to know that maybe there's not going to be a lot of flavor left in the meat. Now, what you've got in this picture is on the left, I roasted a couple of chickens. Unfortunately, roasting a chicken is pretty fast. Um, on the upper right, what you see are chicken feet. And I purchased these chicken feet from a, a, a neighboring farmer. They were beautifully clean, absolutely clean. And they are really, really valuable for adding collagen to your broth. The pig's feet, pig's head, and that pig's feet, chicken feet, chicken head, the wings, the joints, that's where all the collagen is. And so I was real happy to buy these, these chicken feet. Although lots of us are not familiar with it. And on the lower right, what you see bones left over from my having taken the meat off of that roasted chicken. Okay, so what are the other things that you add to your bone broth? In this picture, you've got a tablespoon of black pepper, and I'm using this for my, my um, 
pressure cooker, which is eight quart, an eight quart pressure cooker. So I've got a, a tablespoon or two of pepper, a couple of onions, uh, two or three cloves of garlic, two or three leaves of bay leaf, a tablespoon or so of, of uh, salt. In this case, I've got a, a, a cruder salt. Then I've got some carrots that I'm not dicing or anything like that. I'm just making big pieces. And so you see that onion just cut in half? You see those cloves of garlic? All I've done to those, those vegetables is to take off the root end. And they're going to go into that crock. They're going to go into my pressure cooker or into your crock pot or into your large pot. Doesn't matter which vessel you use. They're going to go in just cut in half and with the skins on. Now, let's take a look at the different appliances. Now, a crock pot, really convenient. The question always is with crock pot is, is it staying at a low simmer? One of the things about crock pots is that maybe until recently, and, and you can check out with your specific brand, the thermal regulator on a crock pot is notoriously poor in keeping things at a low simmer. Things go into a, a rapid simmer or they go into a boil really easily, even at the lowest setting. And when we're making bone broth, we want to keep the simmer low, 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 low. So check out your crock pot, which is, you know, a great device, especially when you're working with very fatty meats like a, a pork butt. But not necessarily for bone broth, but check it out. See how well your crock pot performs. Okay, these are your stovetop pots. The heavy bottom is a must. Otherwise, you'll get burning in your bone broth. You can use those stovetop, oven, or grill. On the stove, they need to be watched to make sure that you don't evaporate too much water. And if you start losing water, you just add some. Add some, and what you want to do is to maintain a really, really low simmer for the length of that process. Okay, and here we've got stove top and electric uh, pressure cookers. Um, how many of you, I'm going to ask this question here, Mike. How many of you have used pressure cookers? How many of you are using pressure cookers? Sylvia, you broke up a little bit there. Can you please restate the question? Certainly, thank you. I'm asking how many of people have used pressure cookers? How many of, our, of you might be afraid of pressure cookers? So far, no one's afraid. Great. <laughs> You've got stout hearts here. All right. Because pressure cookers had a bad, very bad reputation. Uh, you know, they were, they were supposedly exploding all over the world. Um, but they have changed. They've been redesigned. They're very safe. Um, in fact, uh, one of the places that is leading in the development of better pressure cookers is India, believe it or not, where they use pressure cookers extensively. They're easy, they're safe, um, and they're fast. For bone broth, you're still looking at about two to three to four hours. So, all it takes is closing your pressure cooker, locking it, setting it to high, and that's it. It's, got, it's a pretty easy mechanism to use. Now, one of the things I've heard or been asked, oh my goodness, but a pressure cooker, that means that you're taking the temperature up to 250 degrees, and, you're using, and that happens because of the pressure that's, that's built up inside of it. Isn't that destroying the nutrition? Well, I was really concerned about that too when I bought my first pressure cooker. I thought, ah, oh, you know, maybe this is not the best thing to get. It's convenient. Well, I did a bit of research. I went to numbers of sources. And as you and I know, water boils at 212, okay? 
pressure cooking takes it up another um, 38 degrees. So does that make it bad? Does that make only doing things really low temperature better? Well, what you've got in front of you, and you know, when you get the, um, the recording of this particular Zoom, you'll be able to read this a little bit more closely. But what you're looking at there is the fact that when you have high altitude, your um, boiling point is at a lower temperature. So in Miami, you know, when we're at, at uh, sea level, it's 212. When you get to Denver, high altitude, it's 204. Santa Fe, again, further up the mountain, it's 198. Lost 187, and Mount Everest is 160. Now, does that mean that things are really unhealthy in Miami because it's at a higher temperature than it is in, on Mount Everest? Absolutely not. So that difference between 212 and 250 is not that great. And in fact, there are many studies that show pressure cooking, if you lose any nutrition, you're only losing one or 2%. It's minuscule. And in fact, very often boil things for a long time, a lot of nutrition in a boil. And you may even lose some in steaming. So do not be afraid to use your pressure cooker. There is ample research that says it is a good way to uh, preserve the nutrition of your food. Okay, so here's the pressure cooker. This is mine. Um, it preserves nutrition and also combats anti-nutrients, those things that are in bone broth or in vegetables that make it difficult to absorb the nutrition of that food. All right, so once you've either had your bone broth made in a pressure cooker or on a stove top or in a crock pot or in the oven, you have to remove the lid. I'm going to click on this slide and you're going to see the beef well, this is a, I think this is a chicken, a chicken bone broth simmering. And I want you to note how little activity there really is at the surface of the, this liquid. It's barely breaking bubbles. And that's really important. That's where you want to keep the water temperature at when you're doing things so tough. Important to retain the nutrition in bone broth. And so once you're done, what do you really end up with? Well, you end up with the broth, right? And if you had meat that you had some meat hanging out of the bones, you've got some meat and you have fat, clarified fat. Um, I don't know about you, but I happen to love the fat that I gather from my bone broth uh, very often, I just leave it in the jar, and when I pour myself some bone broth in the morning to make myself some uh, broth to start the day, um, I'll have fat floating in it because there's a great deal of flavor, and there's good nutrition that is dissolved in that fat. Now, once your bone broth is done, you can pour it into jars, you can cool it, you can freeze it. Or that bone broth, take off the fat, defat it, and then simmer it vigorously this time in order to reduce it in volume. That way you can actually um, store very concentrated bone broth in a small space. And in fact, this was something that was done uh, very, very frequently in the 1800s, early 1800s, they would make a bone broth kind of a gel or a bone broth leather. And that's what you took with you when you traveled. 
It was a big part of the diet expense for Lewis and Clark as they traveled across the country, was getting bone broth leather. Sylvia, one question. See, uh, more vigorous simmer. Sure. There was a, back when you were, I think when you were showing the picture of the chicken broth, you know, very gently bubbling. Uh, yes. You broke up a little bit, and I think you were saying that it's important to do it that gently in order to preserve the nutrition of the broth. Is that what you were saying? Both the nutrition and the flavor. Yes. So if you do it too vigorously, you'll, you'll lose some of that? Yes, you will. You will. And so when you do it on a stovetop, uh, after a while, you get pretty good at kind of judging the, the height of the flame or the heat beneath that pot. But that's something that you really have to watch because you don't want it to get out of control. You will get off flavors. All right, so once you've cooled it and you've concentrated it, look at what you can get. There's a jar on the upper right of beef bone broth that was reduced and uh, that was just kept in the fridge. And you could see that it's got a really stiff gel to it. That is a really concentrated bone broth. You don't need a heck of a whole lot of that to add to a stew, to add to a chili, to add to another kind of soup that you're making. And, it's, and you can put it in little jars like that, or you can put it into a, into a freezer. Cubes. I freeze it, pop those cubes out of the, out of the, um, tray and then just store the, the cubes in a bag in your freezer for when you need them. So this is just contact information for me and you'll have this, I'm sure. All right, so let's go back and try to uh, go back to my, uh, you can see me. There we go. All right. Looks good, Sylvia. Great, thank you. Oh boy, I just lost you. We can see you. Uh, hold on. Oh, all right, thank you. All right, all right. So there was a slideshow, and again, I did it so that you could have some good pictures of what it is that we're trying to do. Because the actual demonstration, making bone broth is fairly simple. But it does take understanding, you know, what am I going after here? So I'm just going to demonstrate putting stuff together in my Instant Pot, which I've got right here. This is an eight-quart Instant Pot. And it has a stainless steel liner, which I found I really wanted because I didn't want any uh, nonstick coating to come out and, and on my food. And you can lift this out and clean it really easily. So what do you put in here? Where do you start? Well, I'm going to show you. Here's a couple of chicken carcasses from my fridge. I stuck them in here. And because I had them on hand also, I've got some beef bones. Yeah, you can combine bones of different animals when you're making your bone broth. And here, what you can see, I'll bring it up to the camera. What you've got here is a big shank that's been cut up. There's meat on the bone, there's marrow on the bone. And interestingly enough, this is still frozen. And that's one of the big pluses of using a pressure cooker is that you can actually start things somewhat frozen. So I'm just gonna stick this in the pot. Sylvia, do you ever use pork bone broth or make pork bone broth? Uh, you can, I have not. Uh, but yes, you can. You absolutely can. The thing I would not use is any kind of smoked ham hock. You do not want that because that flavor is so strong that 
you're going to be eating, it's going to be like drinking salt. Uh, so I would not recommend that. But sure, absolutely. Okay, so there's my meat. Three bay leaves. Two onions. Don't have two onions? Just use one. And again, I'm not taking off any of the skin. My green, my, my black peppers. My salt. What else should I add? Oh, I know. Hold on a second. Just reach for some garlic. I love garlic. All right. All I'm doing to this garlic is taking off the root end. Just a tiny little piece. Now, if you happen to have vegetables in your refrigerator that are getting a little bit wilted, yes, you can use those. If you've got stuff that's getting slimy and rotten, don't use it, because that will also contribute really off flavors. Now, I like see right now I'm cutting off a little bit of of a damaged part of the garlic. Because why do I want that in there? Goes in there. Let's see. Ah, yes. Yeah. Two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. Is there anything else I needed? No. Here's the garlic. This is not something of finesse necessarily. <laughs> I'm just placing them in this crock pot, this uh, pressure cooker. You can do the same thing with your crock pot, the same thing with your big pot. Here's a big pot. And how much, how much vegetable you put in here, how much uh, meat you put in here really de is determined by the size of your cooking vessel. You know, if I've got a 12 or 16 quart stock pot, I can put more meat, I'll put more vegetables, I'll put all those other components in there. This is an eight quart, but I understand that a lot of this um, volume is being displaced by bones. So I've got to kind of measure out for that as well. All right, that's all that, that's needed. Then I would fill the pot to its, the pressure cooker especially, to its maximum level as indicated by the manufacturer. You don't want to overfill a pressure cooker. Just only ever fill it to that line where your manufacturer has said maximum. Do not play around with that because you, you do want it to be safe. So I don't have uh, water here right now, but I will. And as all of you know, that's all it takes to close an instant pot. It is super easy. Now, I'm just gonna go to the end of my peninsula here. Sylvia, I also have a question for you. Sure. Okay. Uh, some people say that you need to let the apple cider vinegar soak with the bones before cooking. I think so it releases some of the minerals. Is that necessary? You know, I've heard a lot of people do that. Um, I don't know that there's any definitive study on that, but you know what? There's a lot of, I mean, why not do it? If it's not going to add, you know, a whole half day to your cooking, uh, if you got the time, why not? I mean, I put that in there because I know that that is supposed to pull minerals. I mean, that's the whole idea. And if soaking is going to do it better, then do it. I don't have any, any problems with that. Yeah. It's on.
and I'm going to set it because this is a chicken to two hours. There's a, there's a difference in how a stovetop pressure cooker and an electric pressure cooker work. I'll leave it right now. There's a difference. First, the electric pressure cooker takes longer to reach its heat level, and it also doesn't get as hot as a stovetop pressure cooker does. It's several degrees cooler. It's just the way it is. You can walk away from this. That's, that's one of the big pros of using an electronic pressure cooker. You can walk away. The thing is, though, you have to get back in time when this thing reaches the end of its cycle because you don't want it to go to its warm cycle. These things, by default, go into a warm mold, mode, rather, which you don't necessarily want, no matter what you're uh, making in the pressure cooker. All right. Well, I'm going to turn this off because I need to put water in there first. So we're good. Um, now, let's say two hours has passed. I strained out all the solids. And I decided that I was going to reduce my bone broth in order to store it in less space. And in fact, that's what I did today. I took out all the solids, I strained it a bit, and put it back into a pot that I then put on my stove and allowed it to simmer vigorously because I wanted to reduce the volume. And I actually reduced the volume of this bone broth by 70%. There is a whole lot less in this pot than what I started out with. Why would I do that? Well, because I've only got so much freezer space. And I want to be able to preserve things. So I can take this very reduced bone broth now. And I can do a couple of things. I can put it into freezer trays, ice cube trays. Or I can put it in the little canning jars. These work really great in the freezer. Just put a cap on it. And it freezes up just beautifully. I've got gallons of bone broth in my freezer in, in big quart sizes. But they work really great. You don't have to get something really super special in order to freeze your bone broth. So I thought for the, the, the sake of today's demo, what I'm going to do is actually fill a couple of these ice cream trays. Now, Mike, can people see this? You can move it a little bit further to your right. Okay, I'm gonna do that. They can see the white one. There you go. Is that any better? Yep. Okay. I'm just going to unplug the Instapot while we're here, just for safety's sake. All right, so, here we've got two freezer trays. Here's my big pot of reduced bone broth. I'm just going to take a two cup measure. And this has been cooled down significantly. And hope that I don't make a big mess. This was six quarts of bone broth that are now, is now occupying maybe five cups.
Can you use the leftover solids for anything, Sylvia? Like the potatoes or the, I mean the onions. Yeah. No, they're pretty well wasted. I mean, the only thing I guess I would do with them, there are two things. One is use them in the compost. The second thing is if you've got chickens or pigs. Okay. They would love them. Okay, so I filled two, two freezer trays. And then there's a question too, Sylvia, about can you talk a little bit about canning the broth? Does it need to be pressure canned? Yes. Good question. Yes, it does need to be pressure canned because there's not enough acidity in here in order to uh, assure safety if you just do a water bath. You do need to use a pressure canner. Yes. And there are instructions on how to do this in the ball book of canning and lots of things online for that. And just a time check, Sylvia, about 10 minutes. Yep, right? yep. we're good. We're good. Not to hurry you at all. I'm really enjoying the question. And really happy that this uh, bone broth reduced so well. I'm just going to see if I can do this without spilling it all over the place. Whoa. All right. Okay. So now I'll just, this is cool. And these, these jars were heat sanitized. So all I'll do is put a cap on them, put a label on it, and stick it in the freezer. Um, again, when you're doing things for the pressure canner, you're using sterile jars, sterile lids, and uh, turn caps. You are uh, using very, very hot bone broth near, you know, just off boiling so that everything is super hot before you put it into the pressure canner. And that will work well. I, I tend to like to freeze myself. Now, one of the things I think that uh, I mentioned is that um, I took the fat off of my bone broth that I made earlier today. And I love that fat. I use it for simmering vegetables. I use it for making eggs. And here's just a, a look at the fat that rises to the surface of the bone broth. It's that lighter layer on top. Um, that fat is filled with flavor. It is, it's what holds all the flavor from the seasoning that you used in making the bone broth. A lot of that is in the fact, and that's why when I, when I heat up bone broth just to drink in the morning, I do have fat floating on it. And there's also a question about some other uses for that, for that fat possibly, Sylvia. Well, let's see, it's, you know, it's referred to as schmaltz. Um, you know, whatever you fry with, you can use it. Now, I wouldn't use it for making pancakes unless I made a very savory pancake, which of course you can make. Uh, but that's what I would use it for. I, I, I would do it for simmering things, for lightly sauteing things, um, is really where that small, that, that uh, chicken fat shines. Yeah. Well, the, will the fat, how long will the fat or bone broth last in the refrigerator? Okay. The bone broth will last longer in the refrigerator if in fact it is capped with fat because that fat cap will keep anything from uh, further oxidation and bacteria movement. So if you've got a bone broth that's cooled down and has a nice solid cap of fat on it, it will store really well in your fridge for maybe a couple of weeks. Um, freezing it is the better option if you're doing long-term storage or um, doing the pressure canning. That or freezing it. Freezing it, it'll stay for a year. Great. And someone asks, how do you know how much to add to whatever it is you are cooking? Of the broth? Taste it. Not sure. Well, let's say you're making, you're making a, beef, a beef stew. Okay, 
and it calls for some water, some wine, and some broth. You can add as much broth as you want. If you like that flavor, just put it in there. And in fact, lots of recipes for meat dishes, uh, sometimes they use chicken broth instead of bone broth, even when it's a beef dish, because it has a milder flavor. Hmm. And uh, someone's curious, the, the bone broth in the morning, is there a particularly, is that like particularly good in the morning? Like, why do you drink it then? <laughs> It's really satisfying. I find that that little swirl of fat on top, and I, uh, when I'm heating it up, I also add more spice. So I'll add a little bit of oregano, maybe a little bit of basil. Um, if I'm feeling that I really need a health boost, <clears throat> I'll even add a, a half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of turmeric first. And then a dash of salt and a sprinkling of cayenne. And man, I'm set up like for the day. You really had something that is going to be helpful for your body. Yeah, it, I love starting the day off with something like that. And in fact, I recall going to a, a conference. It was a Weston A. Price Foundation conference, uh, which is an organization that is all about healthy ingredients and traditional cooking. Uh, and we were in a major hotel. And of course, major hotels have all kinds of coffee shops in them. But the line in the morning and in the afternoon was at the table that was serving bone broth. They had cauldrons of bone broth going and the lines would just extend out the hall because people were just um, getting both a, a boost of energy, but also being satiated. And you knew that you weren't going to crash two hours after having that bone broth. It really sets you up well in a day. Well, maybe the, well, restaurant, a, maybe the restaurant should start selling bone broth instead of coffee, Sylvia. <laughs> well, a lot of people like it. A lot of people like it. Well, that's pretty much it. Again, this is not, um, this is an attempt to get back to some of the things that people used to do as a matter of course. When you, when you had a joint of beef, when you had a chicken, when you had whatever you were eating, they used to save the bones. You, you could not waste something so valuable because the bone would be filled with marrow. It would have different kinds of, of minerals in it, and you could make a really marvelous bone broth with it. Um, I guess, you know, as we're going through this COVID thing, we're learning that, oh, I'm going to save some of the stuff that maybe I used to discard because it could make some really, really excellent, helpful, great tasting food. Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. And that certainly connects with, you know, rebuilding local food cultures, which is what our mission is about. And then it, that connects, of course, to building healthy soil, which connects to supporting farmers who support healthy soil, which supports our own health. It, it, it really is a circle, even though that's a bit of a trope and a cliche. But, yeah. you know, uh, and one of the neat things we're doing too, as you all may know now, is having Victory Gardens this year. And uh, just so you know, we've, it's pretty exciting. We've sold 175. So 175 people have purchased the, uh, the Victory Garden trays. So, it's just showing the amount of interest out there, and we really appreciate all of you, you know, coming on tonight to learn one of these basic things that probably everyone used to know how to do, right? And right. Uh, sure. and even you know, we we talk about things being organic, and and we also like to say at farm table, well, that's just the way your your grandma or your great grandma or grandfather knew and grew and enjoyed food, really. Um, right. So. Right. Yeah. So I hope everyone has, you know, can have an opportunity to try this. Yeah. Um, it takes some effort, but what we're finding is that real food takes effort. And it, it's, it's about just managing your time. And that's why I've included in those slides those opportunities where you can cut up the process so that you can fit it into the kind of schedule that you want. I guess, well, I guess I also wanted to add, I did not grow up on a farm. I grew up in the middle of New York City. At the Bronx. And I am so grateful now to be in this part of the country 
with the resources we have available to us now. So if you've never made any of this because you grew up in the city, understand that all of this is doable. If I can do it, man, you can do it. <laughs> and I hope that someday that um, wherever you are from, you'll come out and visit us here in, in uh, Amory, Wisconsin. You're more than welcome to visit the farm. And I know that we'd love to have you at the farm table restaurant and, and gallery space. And that, again, becomes something that we can do together. Yeah, thanks, Sylvia, so much. And uh, I also put in the chat box, hopefully you saw Sylvia's phone number and her full name in case you want to search for her on Facebook. Also, Farm Table's uh, phone number for the restaurant and our website. And uh, just so you know, I will send a recording out of this class to all of you. There'll be a link to a YouTube video. And I will, if, if I can get Sylvia's slides, I'll, res I'll send that out to everybody as well. So you'll have some good, good resources to use. Uh, so, and a lot of people just saying thanks so much for a great class and a great offering, Sylvia. So, oh, I'm so happy that we all got together for this. The, your preparation is really, really appreciated. Oh, good, good. All right, everybody, uh, without further ado, happy bone broth making. <laughs> and uh, we, en we enjoy your presence with us. Thank you, Sylvia, as well. Bye bye. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>